Well, I first got a complaint about deer in this willow tree area about 20 years ago. And from then it just sort of bubbled along and lost momentum quite a bit. Um, but over the last five years, there's obviously been a growing concern. Through the landholders, they approached the community advisory group. Um, they've got a landholder in the area who brought it to the LLS. Um, from there, they got a study done. It ended up leading to LLS funding an aerial shoot for the first time to see whether that was uh, a, a means to control the deer in the area. Greg came to me 27 or 8 years ago and asked if we wanted the deer classed as a noxious animal. And of course at that stage when we had six, we didn't want them classed as a noxious animal. And it's gone from that to this. It's really up to the farmers to get together to identify the problem before it happens. And it doesn't happen overnight, so I think more education, I think more talk. It's pretty hard to get farmers to get together and talk, but if they could see what's happening in this area, they'd run for it. We've got money fellow we call ground lice. Um, that's, that's our main, main objective is to get rid of them. We've got red deer. They're a big animal. They stand out. They don't seem to overpopulate in this area. I think if you didn't manage them, they would. But it's mainly the fellow. We've got some chittle that live in the low-lying areas behind houses. Uh, they've been here for 20 odd years. I don't see that they're gonna be a problem. They don't seem to get out of control at all. They don't go to the hills like these. But it's the, the migrative fellow that I call now. We've got local deer that live on the place in little numbers, and we have massive herds, thousands, in migrative mobs that move around. And although the chopper shoot seems to be very successful, time will tell just on how successful it is if we have feed and no one else has. Um, so that'll be interesting down the track. But it's certainly in this low-lying country, we shouldn't have had the deer, and the choppers got rid of them out of that and they don't seem to want to go back into that country. They seem to be pretty shy on the open country. When it used to rain, uh, deer prints everywhere, deer sign everywhere, more and more, and um, shooting at night, yeah, the mobs were getting bigger and we just couldn't keep up. So um, there's, a lot, there's a lot more we have to do other than just look after cattle, feed cattle and with off-farm income, go to work. You then have to come home and um, feed cattle, then shoot, and um, yeah, gets pretty repetitive. Um, so feral deer here have been a massive problem. Um, you end up walking grass, uh, you're not walking grass off in cattle's bellies, which is where the money is made. Like most grazing properties are uh, grass growers. But it's not only what they eat in the grass value, it's more um, uh, your fence damage and your weed control. Uh, I inherited St John's wort, um, kulatai grass and fireweed in one season over half the property because the neighbours above me had done nothing with the deer. Uh, wouldn't let you shoot the deer on their side of the fence. So they grazed on our side during the nights and ran back in their place during the day. And that went on for years and years and they didn't realise the problem that was there either. So it was a bit of ignorance from everyone to start with. Uh, and then when, you, when we had these deer numbers, we, I think we got a bit used to them. Used to looking at so many deer, I think, for so many years. The grass, it disappears overnight, really. And it wasn't really until the drought hit that people really had a look at what was going on. Um, and um, prior to that, I think the, um, the large numbers built up in the rains that you didn't see. And then when you got a dry season, they, they came down in large numbers. And we're not talking hundreds, we're talking thousands of them. As we are here, uh, a lot of my back country has um, decreased in um, running capacity for around about a third to a half to the uh, paddocks that are right on the back. We're down to 60 cows from 200. You'd have, um, go to a cottonseed trough that you're feeding cattle and you'd have 50 deer run away from you too. So I'd, I'd hate to think what they just cost us in the last 12 months alone, but uh, but um, they're particularly bad on, on crops. Like we grow sorghum just up the road and, and deer there, they, they're particularly destructive. They, they'll sort of knock it all over, eat the heads off really quickly. They're worse than pigs. Uh, and, and the effect it has is we've had to both have off-farm income um, to be able to support not only feeding of the cattle because we no longer can rely on the property and the property is well and truly big enough and productive enough to run the number of cattle we have 
we are very conservative with our numbers, so we can't depend on our land anymore. What it came down to, especially over the last two years, and it commenced, um, I recorded October 2017, when we really started intensively feeding the cattle, that we would have to come home, you know, do dinner and make feed and be out at night time feeding cattle. And it, it, you just can't sustain that. The deer only eat the best feed, you know. They don't, the, the, you'll see the cattle and things are tough, you know, they're in the paddock they're in, they can't get out, they can't go, you know, to the one next door that we've locked up. They've got to make do with what they've got, but the deer can go wherever they want. Um, pretty hard to believe unless you actually see it. And I think we got used to the look of that for a while. But as the dry set in, you just can't have that going on. This is a huge problem. It's something bigger than we can possibly contend with. What are we going to do? How, how can we eradicate them? Is there a poison we can use? We talked about uh, exclusion fencing. Can we sort of, that's really looking after yourself though, isn't it really? If you, you know, you fence your own property with exclusion fencing, you're looking after number one, that's not going to, that's not a community uh, solution at all, is it? So, you know, and it's only affordable to some. So that's not really the answer either. I think you'd nearly pull all your hair out, yeah, with what was going on. And once you identified the problem and gone and had a really good look at it, uh, a lot of people couldn't sow oats in this country before these helicopter shoots. Uh, you just couldn't sow oats because the deer come in and ate it. It was, just simply wasn't worth it. So a couple of years ago, as a member of the Upper Mukai Land Care Group, uh, conversations, you know, amongst us being myself, the other landholders around me, you know, the whole community really in this area, talked about the deer and the impact it was having on us. Um, you know, talking about what can we do, what solutions are out there, where can we get help from. Um, following on from that, um, a local member of the Upper Mukai Land Care Group who's, who's always been a really active member, Heather Ranclaude, you know, really pushed um, the local, the local uh, Liverpool Plain Shire Council uh, that we need to lift restrictions because deer have always been reviewed as a, an, as a game animal and therefore to hunt and shoot them for you know, culling purposes to reduce the numbers was never something we could do and frowned upon and you couldn't spotlight them and there were just so many restrictions so the push that came from that area was fantastic because that meant we could go out and start culling even though as I said before um, it the number didn't really have the impact we needed, but it was a start. So thank God that we did have that um, push from, the, from that group, that land care group, that we did have the uh, council come on board. And I think it was probably a good thing because that's how we did find out how high the numbers were because when you're out there spotlighting at night or early hours of the morning, that's when you're really seeing how big the problem is. It becomes unsustainable as a business uh, with the numbers that, are, that have been here because the, uh, the deer, like everybody else, they'd rather eat sponge cake than, uh, say, a biscuits. Yeah, so we're, we're actively trying to do it, do uh, our own vermin control, definitely. Yeah. We got a, uh, a letter in the mail, uh, a mail out saying, you know, were we interested in taking part in a cull, a deer cull, that uh, there was hopefully some government funding for the local land services to to carry that out in this area because this area had been identified. We had meetings at our local hall. Um, everyone was sick of the deer, so everyone went. Overall, the success of a program is only as good as the people that are involved in it. And we were lucky that the landholders really participated in this. Uh, they were actively involved and reporting what they were seeing. And, and it just makes our job so much easier to get a program up and running, um, you know, and that will continue as long as it, you know, as long as they keep reporting and so forth, there, there's the opportunities out there that the work will be done and look for other avenues to control deer. Um, so yeah, it was very important to us to, you know, help the LLS get these deer under control here so that our neighbours aren't being impacted massively and their incomes. So. Um the cull of the deer has, has meant for us, look, not only a feeling of relief, but a feeling of um, positivity and looking to the future with a better, with a better attitude and, a, and an outlook. You know, bottom line, I won't have to spend as much on cattle feed. We don't have to contend with feeding the deer as well. Oh, the cows are so happy, listen to them. We're, while we're still feeding, 
uh, we were able to lock paddocks up and they are coming away. So um, there's hope there, but um, I think everybody just wants more rain. And, and the effect that it has had on the place and, and then seeing the after effects now that we've had a little bit of rain and, and the growth, you can tell where there was no feed and it was chewed to the boards, not by cattle. And now we have grass under fences where deer have been popping under. There's no traffic. Um, you know, it's made a massive impact on the place. That, yeah, the, the biggest thing is that the staff aren't seeing the numbers in the paddocks. One of the biggest um, differences here is we can plant crop and you can drive around it over night time and we don't actually have you know, two or three hundred deer grazing it of a night time, chewing it down to the to the dirt, um, and, we're, and we're actually getting somewhere with pastures. It's good to see things happen and, and realise there's a problem. We're really happy. There's still some out there. We need to now help the situation by maintaining our diligence and going out there and, and culling what we see. So we have to remain diligent as a community, and we still need to go out there every week, you know, and, and shoot whatever we see. With this program, um, it didn't get off until the deer numbers were really large. I mean, our figures look spectacular, but it's a you're working on the problem when it's at its worst. So I'd just like all landholders who are seeing a few deer now to um, think, oh, not to think that, oh, they, they're pretty, I don't mind having a few deer on my farm, because it, it's only a few years from that until the problem that we've got up here. And they're no longer pretty, but they're a real detriment to your business. Um, so if you're starting to see a few deer, if you report it to your biosecurity officer, your local biosecurity officer says, we can note it and then we can get down to working out ways of dealing with that problem straight away. If you, if you know there are deer coming to your area, move quickly. Uh, they're not just my deer, they're everybody's deer. So I'd, I'd prefer to jump on them while, while they're in small numbers and, and try and keep on top of them before you, you really see massive production losses. I keep telling people all the time that the deer is the new rabbit. I uh, would recommend to anyone to uh, really keep an eye on your property. If you see two or three deer, you've probably got 30 or 40. If you see 50, you've got 500. They're not sweet bambies that just jump and look lovely. They flatten your fences completely and your feed. Treat them as vermin, that is what they are. Uh, we, we should have done something 20 years ago. Uh, we didn't realise then we had to. It's really up to the farmers to get together to identify the problem before it happens. If they could see what's happened in this area, they'd run for it.